Well, welcome back, everyone. Again, I'm Catherine Hill Ritchie. I'm an active member of ACG since 2016. I'm head of the ACG New York family office, and I also sit on the ACG New York board. I also have a full-time job working at the Nottingham Spark family office. The past few months, the world has just turned upside down, and we want to highlight family offices and their executives that are using their network and capital uh, for good. I'd like to introduce you to Carol Pepper, and Carol will tell us about the positive initiatives she's been working on. But please first, Carol, tell us a little bit about your background. Hi, Catherine. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of your broadcast. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, so I've had my company, Pepper International, for the last 19 years. I do three things. I set up family offices all over the globe from scratch for families that don't have a family office. I consult to single family offices and help them improve and inc their operations. I work as um, helping them with their family governance and basically getting them to the next level in all ways so that they can successfully transition between generations. And then I act as the external chief investment officer to several very large single family offices with an emphasis on social impact. Um, I have been acting as a chief and external I have been acting as an external chief investment officer uh, since, since the beginning of my firm. And prior to forming Pepper International, I worked for the Rockefeller family office where I managed over a billion dollars. And before that career, I had a long career in M&A corporate finance with big firms like JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and Credit Suisse. Um, I also have written a book called The Seven Pearls of Financial Wisdom, A Woman's Guide to Enjoying Wealth and Power. And I'm a regular television uh, expert for CNBC and Bloomberg Television talking about the markets and what wealthy families are doing with their money. Fantastic. And we've known each other for quite, quite a long time, actually. And yes. I'm so happy you're here with me today. So, Carol, you know, you're based in New York City. Uh, can you tell us what you personally uh, saw and uh uh, found that troubled you during uh, the beginning of the COVID crisis? Yes, well, it, it was really shocking. I was spent most of the month of January actually in California, and then I came back to New York in February, and COVID was just beginning then. Uh, and by the end of February, early March, COVID had really started to hit in New York, and the city started to empty out. Um, and I and myself and my husband, we decamped from our house to our house in Long Island to Bayshore, where we've been sheltering in place. And then we're going into the city a couple of times a week to check on what's going on at the office and pick up mail, et cetera. New York City has become essentially a ghost town. Um, it's starting to come back to life a little bit now. Um, but I was all along, I began receiving phone calls from my clients saying that they were really struggling to get a hold of medical equipment and PPE, whether they were on a board of a hospital and they couldn't, the hospital couldn't source gloves and masks and other personal protective equipment. They couldn't source COVID tests. Um, a friend of mine, for example, works for the University of Washington in Seattle and they had, um, they had ordered all this viral transport medium. They were doing COVID tests, but they needed the medium to transport the test results. And what they received was, um, contaminated, so they wasted millions of dollars from trying to get uh, new material in. Another family office ordered millions of masks from Asia and they came without strings on the masks so they couldn't be attached properly. So it was definitely um, the scramble, the sense of chaos, and then a desire to, to help and get geared up, but, but everybody in the world needing supplies at the same time just completely jammed the system um, from that perspective in terms of providing what hospitals and companies needed and first responders at that point, hospitals and first responders needed to actually work. So I had in January I had met a phenomenal doctor. We were working on a project together in California named Dr. Kareem Marmush. He is a radiologist by background, but in the recent years has done, you know, setting up hospitals, emergency rooms, doing business and financial consulting in the medical community. And, uh, he was hearing the same, you know, also trying to source supplies. And then I realized that I had all these phenomenal relationships that I had developed from the last 20 years of my business going to Asia in particular and working with families in Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, and Korea. And I thought, well, maybe they can help us get more reliable supplies into the country. So Dr. Marmish and I uh, decided to partner up and, and uh, he had 
the rights to a company called Karma, which I thought was a terrific name <laughs> for business. So we started the Karma Medical Marketplace to help family offices and all the companies that they either own or they're on the board of or the medical government or um, hospital chains to reliably and professionally source medical equipment and supplies. So Carol, tell me more about that. It sounds like, uh, you know, it, you really used a, a, a grassroots effort of your network to help solve this problem and kind of the right people and players showed up in front of you to help. So could you tell us more about the extent, because I know that you've helped uh, place, I mean, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even millions of gloves and masks and things like that. So could you, you tell us more about it? Yeah, um, our first order was for 120 million gloves for wow. one of the largest corporations in America, who again was then sending them out to various hospitals and things. So um, it, it, it was definitely a, a situation where the the families or the relationships have been built over a long period of time. And what I always tell people about the family office business is that we're a very collaborative community. We're a very collegial community. And picking up the phone to call uh, one of the fellows I called immediately. Uh, we had sat down in Dubai in December. So we had been together fairly recently, had had a long chat at, um, I think it was the SALT or one of, one of the big conferences over there. And, um, you know, just had a, had had a great exchange recently. And then when I picked up the phone and said, hey, can you help? He was right there and immediately was able to get in touch with the family that he works with. And we were able to get going. And another was a long, long relationship I've had for over 10 years with a family from Korea. And again, they were immediately able to get get out there and, and do the due diligence, because as we know, everything in life is based on relationship and trust. And when you in this market, there has been so much fraud, so many people. Right being um, misled or literally putting massive millions and millions of dollars into escrow and then no product shows up or money being even the u.s government has had money stolen um, there was a 45 million dollar fraud for selling masks recently in new york so the, this you know all these people that are used to dealing in say regulated markets or normal markets in normal times were suddenly in a almost like a black market or a drug market because there's this very limited supply of this very hot good and product and um, and there's no way to get to it. And, and there's probably sometimes there were five and 10 and 15 layers of middlemen before between yeah. the product and the buyer. So prices were getting becoming gouged, which we heard a lot about on television. And, you know, imagine you're on the board of Dana-Farber Hospital or some huge uh, Northwell Health out here in, Be in Long Island. And you are suddenly having to find millions of boxes of gloves or, or millions of masks. How on earth are you going to go about that? You've never had to face that problem before. And those supplies are most likely overseas in another country where you have no contacts. So that, that's why this has been so challenging. Well, well you know, Carol, it's it's just uh, that's why we want to highlight these stories is, is you know, not only is COVID an issue in itself, uh, but the fact that it's despicable that people would actually, I mean, these are our frontline workers who save our lives. And to think that people would try to uh, sell them fraudulent goods is truly despicable. But what's great, well, what's been exposed is that, uh, uh, I've said this before, we can't just sit back and rely upon institutions or governments to take care of us and take take care of everything. We've got to have smart uh, entrepreneurial people like you who are well connected that can and you know connect the dots mm -hmm. and and you know you can do that in a few phone calls. I mean that's very powerful. But Carol, you and other people, we could sit under our laurels and wait this out, but we didn't. You know, you, you took action and an initiative and put this together. And I know it's taking you, you know, you're taking phone calls late at night and and uh, you're really using your network. And that's what's important to highlight here is that, you know, you're using your capital and network uh, for positive and good initiatives to help. And that's something that we want to highlight and also uh, raise the profile because maybe there are other people who you could be connected with after uh, uh, this gets viewed. So that's the purpose of all this. Uh, but while I've got you here, you are an expert in the family office world. So mm -hmm. I would love to hear you talk a little bit about uh, the current climate, how you think it will impact and evolve the investment strategies for family offices 
kind of uh, what you're focused on today? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the world has truly changed. There are those who think it's all going to go, you know, this is going to blow over and it's just going to go away and be a bad dream in six months. I don't think that's true. Even if I look on the on the medical marketplace side, the corporations are asking us to set up two-year supply lines. So everybody in the corporate side and government side is assuming this virus will be around and unchecked for two years minimum. Wow. If you accept that as a baseline thesis, then you have to look at what's been, ha you can simply look at what's been happening in the, in the markets to see which businesses are doing well. It's technology and healthcare. Those are, wh which businesses are not doing well? Oil has been decimated because there's no demand. Commercial real estate is gonna be in trouble because people aren't paying their rents. Um, eventually there will be, you know, a break in all these rent subsidies for individuals and then the, the apartments can, can begin to have problems. So um, I think the wise person is going to look at the fact that this is going to be very much a winners and losers market until the whole world restructures around this new reality. I wish I could say the whole world's going to get vaccinated and we're going to go back to the way it was, be able to function as we did before. But frankly, I, I don't believe that that's true. If you look at polio or other diseases, it was a five to 10 year process to really restructure and get that disease under control. So from an investment point of view, what I'm telling people to do is really barbell, have lots of cash, as much cash as you can, hoard your cash, maybe cash in very short, you know, two, three year fixed income facilities will give you two or 3% right now. That's fine. Don't take any risk on bonds. I know they're supporting high yield bonds, but I personally think that's quite risky. Um, so that's, what, you know, hoard as much cash as you possibly can and ideally have two to three years worth of expenses on the side to, to carry your all your expenses. Then in terms of investment, I think certainly technology can, if you want to be in the market, look for, you know, the ETFs like QQQ and the technology stocks like Amazon, they are going to continue, the big winners are going to continue to be winners. There's going to be a persistence of winning for those that have already captured the game. Um, for private investments, certainly. Lots of people I know we're looking into, you know, funding various cures, funding vaccine trials, funding all sorts of med tech. Right. I think that's going to be big. Um, anything that helps people work from home. Um, for example, one of the products we sell at our marketplace is a uh, mask and thermal sensing camera that you can put on a big building. So when people walk into your building, you know whether or not they, they're sick. Uh, industrial air purifiers. I know Nottingham Spurk itself, where you are, Catherine, is a great innovator of all kinds of products. So any kind of product in for innovation with an eye to the fact that people will at least be working part-time at home. Anything that helps outsource, remote learn, remote use, improving online education, certainly, which uh, is okay, but not great now. A lot of people can't, don't really enjoy it. Um, so, so just assume that the whole, whole of life has now changed and you know, maybe people will go in the office two or three days a week, but they're not probably gonna be in the office you know, eight, 18 hours a day like they used to be. So I really think uh, embracing this change as opposed to resisting it is how you're going to make the most money because there's definitely a first mover advantage. We've already found with the medical marketplace by just getting in as early as we did, we're now becoming a trusted supplier. Mm -hmm. And that's the goal in anything, you know, in this new world, we're, we're much more dependent on internet, we're much more dependent on online services. But when we do go out in public, we are going to continue to need to be protected. So from that perspective, Anything that's that kind of for the next two years, I would say anything that supports functioning better in this world that we're all facing globally, because there's a global shortage of everything um, is where you'll make your money. That makes a lot of sense. And thank you for that perspective. I mean, I think you really covered it from publics to privates. And it's uh, great to hear from you because a lot of uh, investors are, are sitting on their hands. They're just not sure what to do. And you've got a volatile stock market and uh, they're not sure what direction to go in. So uh, that was very helpful. And really, Carol, thank you for coming on and sharing with us. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, if people uh, want to go to your website, they can, but also that uh, Karma is there and is a trusted source. It's supplied governments and hospitals. And so if people need uh, those uh, PPE uh, that you're a trusted source, they can go to. But again, I just want to thank you so much for joining me. And and uh, thank you again for all of your good work. Thank you, Catherine. And keep up this wonderful broadcast. I think it's very helpful for people. And the last thing I will say is that all of us in the family office space have phenomenal networks. You may be surprised if you stop and think about the people that you know. They may be doing things that you're not even aware of. And it's a great excuse to pick up the phone and just not don't just pitch them another investment 
uh, idea or thesis, actually find out what their business is, what their pain points are, and what they need to move forward now. And that I've always found in my business over the last 35 years or so, helping people where their pain point is, is how you build those strong relationships. So then when you need help, they're there to pick up the, you know, respond to your call and pick up and help you. Yes, wise words from a wise woman. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Catherine.